My name is Priyam Patel, and I am a tenure track assistant professor at the University of Utah. So when I was young, I would say definitely I gravitated towards math and science. Those were always the things I liked the most in school and the things I did best at. And I always really liked puzzles. I know it's such a quintessential and cliche thing to like, but I definitely was into problem solving in some ways. So I don't think I knew what a mathematician was for most of my life. Um, I knew I wanted to major in math. And when I was an undergraduate major in math, I knew that I wanted to get my PhD. But part of that was because I wanted to teach at the college level. And I would say it wasn't until I actually got to the PhD program and saw what my professors were spending their time on and the way that they handled their jobs that I really understood what it was to be like a mathematician. And so I would say it's, it's like a twofold answer. Like part of me knew all along, but didn't actually know what the job entailed. And then definitely while I was in the PhD program, I was like, yeah, this is what I really want to do. So I am interested in problems in low dimensional topology, hyperbolic geometry and geometric group theory. So those are like three little areas that I'll start to just explain. Um, low dimensional topology is topology in low dimensions. So topology is the study of the shapes of spaces, but unlike in geometry where you have a notion of distance and objects are rigid, topology, you imagine that your objects are made out of very stretchy, bendable material. So low dimensions means I study one, two, three, and sometimes four dimensional objects, very rarely four, because I like to see, really be able to visualize the things that I'm working with. Hyperbolic geometry is extremely important in low dimensional topology because it's the most common form of geometry that arises out of all of the objects you might study, the most prevalent are hyperbolic objects. So hyperbolic geometry is an, is an example of non-Euclidean geometry. And non-Euclidean geometry takes the axioms of Euclid's geometry and it breaks some of them. So in, for most of the, most non-Euclidean geometries are interesting in that they break the parallel postulate. And then the third area that I mentioned is geometric group theory. And this is really a bridge between algebra and group theory and geometry. And so usually in geometric group theory, you're trying to understand um, a group by the way it acts on a space or understand properties of the space via the action of the group on the space. And within all of those three areas, I would say like the connecting piece for me is understanding surfaces, which are two dimensional manifolds. Um, and I, one of the biggest things that I study is understanding the symmetries of surfaces and often the group of symmetries, which is called the mapping class group. So I think a lot of the struggles that I went through are pretty common for women and people of color, unfortunately, in math. I had a ton of confidence issues after being in grad school for a couple of years. I was one of very few women in my cohort, one of two out of 12. So I was often the only one in the room. And I felt that my opinion didn't matter, that if I had an idea for a homework set, it wasn't really taken seriously. Um, you know, those sort of microaggressions that you hear about, very prevalent in my life throughout that time where someone would express surprise that my paper, my first paper got into the journal that it did. And I almost wanted to just scream at them, like, why are you so surprised, right? Like, this is what kind of work I've been producing. I have never faltered in my career so far. So um, those, that kind of messaging definitely started to break my confidence. And I sort of pegged myself as someone who couldn't do research. And my advisor thankfully said to me, like, I really think you'll regret it if you only go into a teaching role, even though I know you love teaching. And he was right. Um, I ended up applying for research postdocs and every step of the way, I think, you know, my support system and my accomplishments have sort of shown me like, no, I deserve to be here. And, you know, at some point, I think some, you start to do well enough where you can't like deny it to yourself. Like you can't keep lying to yourself. Um, but it took me a really long time to sort of get over that hurdle. 
and to truly believe in myself again, which is a shame that was signaling I was, you know, it's not just made up. It's not just imposter syndrome for the sake of imposter syndrome. It's signaling that I was receiving from my community that I was only, you know, this young woman who liked to dress up nice and wasn't going to be taken seriously as a mathematician until I really established myself. And I, I couldn't deny that I was doing a good job and other people couldn't really brush my accomplishments under the rug either, that I regained that confidence. So I'm going to share two because there's one more obvious one and then one less obvious one that I'd like to share. Of course, like one of the best days of my life was when I was awarded the NSF career grant because, you know, it was in the middle of the pandemic and everything seemed so hopeless for a while. And I really missed my community and just, you know, getting that sort of nod of approval from a really amazing organization. I was just over the moon. I can very candidly share that I sobbed my eyes out. I was so happy. <laughs> it was a very touching moment for me to not only be recognized for my research, but also to be given serious funds to affect the community in a positive way and to make change. So that's like, of course, the more obvious one. But the less obvious one that I thought of, and I think it speaks a lot to what drives me as a mathematician, is that while I was a postdoc at Purdue, one of my undergraduate linear algebra students, without telling me, had nominated me for a National Inspiring Integrity Award. And her essay won. When I saw what she wrote about me, and, and the name of that award, Inspiring Integrity, was for me definitely one of the proudest moments, like to know that the things that I was doing, even at that early career stage, to try to affect my students in a positive way was truly working, to me was just very touching. And it's the thing that I get the most emotional about if you hear me talk about my students is that validation that all the time and effort I put in to making my classroom and mentorship more inclusive they're really feeling it and seeing it. And that nod of approval from them is probably the most precious thing to me as a mathematician. So I, early on in my career, definitely did not have a ton of role models. Um, you know, it's different. Of course, I can say I had wonderful mentors who influenced me in really positive ways and who I could not be here without. But it's a little bit different to talk about a role model because typically that's somebody that you see yourself in, right? So one person who I thankfully got to meet one time, and it was one of the best experiences of my life that has always inspired me is Maria Mirzakhani, right? She definitely, I see, I could see myself just, you know, being from Asia and being a woman, I definitely could see aspects of myself in her. And we are, are definitely close research-wise, right? She works with surfaces and curves on surfaces and moduli space. And these are things that I've been trained in, really. It really influenced my career positively to be in a room with somebody that prolific and feel so comfortable, right? You don't have to be uncomfortable around a very fancy mathematician is what that taught me, right? So one thing I'm lucky about is that later on, things started to change for me. So like I said, I work in geometric group theory and I commonly cite this group of women that are about six years ahead of me or so, six or seven years ahead of me. And they have this beautiful cohort and they're all really close friends, collaborators and extremely serious mathematicians. I remember being at um, a conference at UIC extremely early on in my career maybe I was a postdoc already. And Jing Tao, who is now a great friend of mine, had just won her first NSF grant. And she was wearing this leather jacket and was so cool. And I was like, wow, like I want to be like her, you know? And yeah, and I mean, now I would say we're much, you know, we're, we're friends. Like she, I'm in that group of women and they really have influenced a lot of us coming up behind them and have organized women in geometry groups and dynamics conferences that just bring us all together. And I'm very, very thankful for that. So those women in geometric group theory and definitely Ruth Charney, who is a much more senior woman in, geome in geometric group theory, was, you know, once I met her and these women, I started to see myself, you know, potentially thriving in this research area. And I really appreciate 
both their mentorship and just how friendly all of them have been and welcoming they've all been to me. Yeah, there's two big pieces of advice that I sort of thought of. The first one is to surround yourself with people that make you feel good about yourself, whole self, and especially make you feel good about your math and make you happy while doing mathematics, right? We don't always have that choice early on in our careers, but as you start to have more autonomy over your work and who you work with, work with people who make you happy. Good math will get done if you work hard and you, and you keep at it. And it's not worth being miserable in a collaboration. And especially if someone is not treating you as an equal, um, you don't need to be in that project. That's the first thing. And the second thing that's always helped me is like, follow your gut, right? Like, you know what's best for yourself. Your inner voice tells you something pretty often and is edging you into a certain direction. Um, what, which avenue do I want to take in my career? How do I want to approach this issue, this problem? Which math problem should I tackle? What should I do about my job choices? Follow your gut and consult people who know you well over many years. Like if you happen to have close friends or family members, consult with them, not just with mathematicians. Um, this is coming from my experience where I turned down a tenure track job in my fourth year of postdoc. It was my first year at Santa Barbara, and it was a very controversial choice to get a prestigious tenure track job and to say, this isn't the right move for me. It was frowned upon by some people and some other people said, yeah, do what you need to do. And in the end, I knew I had two more years of my postdoc in Santa Barbara, and I also was okay with the consequences of maybe never getting another tenure track offer, but I knew I could do other things with my life if it came to it. And in that moment, when I had to say no, I followed my gut. I didn't feel like that job and that location was the best for me at that time. And thankfully, it worked out for me. I couldn't have been more right about that. I ended up truly getting my dream job, working with people who I've admired my whole career. Um, but that's because I didn't, you know, just cave into what people expect young academics to do. Typically, young academics are asked to sacrifice everything at the, you know, everything for mathematics. And, you know, though I do tend to give the advice, like you could live anywhere for a few years if you had to, like you can find happiness where you are. When you're thinking about a more serious lifelong decision, you are allowed to prioritize yourself, your people in your life, and what your gut is telling you you should do.